All right, so uh, our three panelists are uh, Raymond Knopp. Uh, uh, Raymond is a, a professor uh, at Eurocom and the president of the uh, uh, Open Air Software Alliance. Uh, we have uh, Ritwik uh, that you heard uh, in, during the, the, the short talks. He's a chief architect of brand intelligence at VMware and Matti uh, uh, also uh, one of the speakers in the short talks uh, and um, uh, ex uh, former PLT for the RIC platform. So uh, thank you for uh, for joining the panel, first thing. And uh, so I, I, I prepared a set of questions. And again, if anyone has any question that would like to ask and would like to be addressed by the panel, please feel free to step in and, and ask away. But just to uh, break the ice, probably we can start with, uh, with one question. And the, the general idea, uh, general discussion uh, that I would like to have in this panel is how can we uh, make this ecosystem, this software-based ecosystem for the run sustainable? How can it evolve? How can it meet the constraints and the requirements of software that needs to drive the next generation of mobile networks, right? So uh, the, the, first the first question is this. So the run is moving towards software, right? And um, where do you st still see some challenges relating to uh, implementing softwareized approaches for the run? And where are the areas in which software has yet not arrived, but you think will benefit from having some software uh, in, in, uh, in the ecosystem? So I'll stop sharing and so that we can see our webcam. And uh, I don't know, maybe Raymond, you want to go first? Oh, you gave me the hard job here. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, from my perspective is the perspective of a, of a researcher. Uh, so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily have the same opinion as some of the other panelists, so that's very good. Uh, you know, from my perspective, the, the, the key challenges when it comes to um, you know, implementing RAN in software, uh, in particular now that we're going into the, the 5G era, um, was really the, the, uh, the sheer bandwidths and the latency requirements. See, I mean, uh, if you look at the, the, the 4G implementations that, that people are using in research, like Open Air Interface, SRS, or even Amarisoft, um, they work, um, you know, because, uh, because of the timing that 4G uh, allowed. Uh, if you went to a system like Wi-Fi, uh, even early versions of Wi-Fi, because of the, the, the timing, it's extremely difficult to do that in a, in a, in a fully software-based system, even though there have been some um, successful attempts at doing that with some hard, additional hardware support. But when it comes to a system like 5G, which is highly configurable uh, uh, in, in the layer one and in the Mac layer, um, it's you know, extremely challenging to be able to implement any configuration that 5G is going to throw at you. Um, so I, I think that that is one of the key challenges for me, at least from a research perspective. So when you say any configuration, you mean like all the configurations that 5G sees or? Uh... Well, I mean, you know, t t today we're working in some research projects with, uh, with, with companies that are doing, um, uh, putting innovative multimedia applications on top of uh, 5G, which have very short feedback loops. Um, you know, so we're, we're talking about round trip um, times on the order of the millisecond. Uh, you know, if you want to do that with a USRP or even some of the commercial radio heads that, that we have access to, that becomes extremely challenging. Uh, and, and without some form of hardware support, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it may not be possible. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. And uh, so what about like moving away from USRPs, for example, to the, the ORAN uh, architecture in principle as we 7.2 split that can match software in the view and CU with generic radios that may not necessarily need to be USRPs, right? Uh, any thoughts on, on this? Well, yeah, so, um, oh, go, go ahead. ahead, please go ahead, please go ahead. Yeah, so I think we need to kind of maybe decouple perhaps the management plane and the control plane. Yeah. Softwareizing the management plane 
it today is is challenging because uh, you have to deal with the uh, issue of openness and and multi-vendor openness. So it's not. Uh, I mean, the features of uh, element management system is already in software, right? Today, most of the features are um, configurable through software. It's not softwareizing in EMS. It's it's opening up the RAN. That's that's really the challenge. And opening the RAN means you want to make the management plane uh, one that that all vendors will kind of comply to, right? In a uniform manner. So you have to standardize the management plane, but at the same time, you have to provide differentiation to each vendor so that there is certain certain amount of differentiation in the in the market, right? Otherwise, all all radios would be exactly the same with the exact same features. So the difficulty in the management plane, I believe, is if I were to draw a Venn diagram, the data model of a specific vendor, ten percent of that model is three GPP. 90% of that data model is vendor proprietary. So the, the real question to ask is, how can you open up a RAN when only 10% of the radio features are standardized? The, all the smarts and the secret sauce is really in the 90%. And each vendor has its own specific secret sauce. And so the question becomes, how can you, how can you address the feature set of all the vendors in a uniform way. So take so take uh, take load balancing as an example. Load balancing is a feature that exists in every radio vendor, right? If you go to the standards and say, I want to standardize load balancing, it's it's a very difficult proposition because you know some vendors might have hundred features, right? Hundred different parameters that train their machine learning models to do load balancing. Some simple uh, machine learning model might take only two or three features. So then the question becomes, how do you standardize something like that? It's not like a, I state the input and I get this output. The input feature set is huge. And so you cannot go to a standards body and say, I want to standardize machine learning. I want to standardize QOE arbitration. And so really part of Open RAN is about addressing that aspect, I think. And that is why it's so hard. You know, I, I think I kind of danced around your question a little bit, but at the end, I think that is really yeah. softwareizing the management plane comes down to. Softwareizing control plane is something different because there you want to provide the actual controls that will give you cell level control or user level control. And that, that's kind of happening in E2, right? Yeah, and, and then softwareizing the data plane, which is what Raymond was talking about, yeah. is. Another, even another set of, of challenges. So, Matty, I see that you are muted. Yeah. You yes. Uh, so, so the uh, the RAN. I'm not really a layer one person, but uh, but my from my point of view, RAN is going to be all software. Like uh, there's big push on um, putting CUs and DUs on some type of cloud platforms. They may have some hardware acceleration, but but that's it's it's definitely going there. But what uh, so far the software is proprietary. That's kind of related to what Ritwick was saying. But what uh, what E two is really doing is opening up that uh, vendor proprietary RAN to these custom uh, customization capabilities through um, E two and XAP. So I think that's that's a wonderful thing for both providers and for the research community. Uh, when we eventually get there and uh from well the the e2 is still evolving and we have the e2 ap and now we have some e2 service models but so there's still some work to do in the standards but then then the big hurdle uh will be getting the vendors to implement those standards so so that we can start building x app so i think the ran will be software it's just how much can we customize it with third-party X apps or other third-party uh, R apps or 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 things like that. Mm -hmm. If I can, can I just add to that a little bit. I think uh, one of the reasons why you see the web world has taken off is because the diversity of developers that exist for web applications is huge. 
right? The APIs exist, the SDKs exist, and anybody can build a web application. I'm, I'm saying anybody meaning, you know, large fraction of people can easily pick up tools and without a whole lot of understanding of the domain knowledge can still build an app. That's not the true for RAN. For RAN, if you have to bring it to the mass market developers, you have to make an understanding that they have to understand 3GPP. You have to understand these resource models and how radios work and the protocols and it's, and it's decades of work. That's, that's the barrier to entry. So I think as part of open RAN, like what Mate is saying, right? If the APIs and SDKs can be very simple, simplicity is really the game in town. If, if they can be simple such that I can take any, you know, maybe a high school app developer or a college grad app developer, give them the API, go build a load balancing algorithm. They should be able to do a decent job. Of course, it won't be commercially marketable, but they should be able to get 80 to 90% of it correct. That's not, that's not the case today. The case today is people who are experts in the field can only understand those data models and the ASN encoding and the decoding and the latency to figure out how to build these apps. And it's not like you, know, you go to the Apple marketplace and just download the Apple uh, web development kit and build an app. It should be as simple as that, but it's not. And well. I I don't know how to get to that, right? No, Mati, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I think uh, that's a nice vision, but I think you're a little, a little <laughs> early off to this. Evangelize it. <laughs> because I think uh, even if we provide a nice SDK and, and uh, nice environment to build X apps, you still have to have domain knowledge, domain knowledge. to yes. really build anything meaningful because like- I But do you think that's the case for Wi-Fi? Do you think <laughs> Wi-Fi wi app developers are better suited than cellular app developers. Like the barrier to entry for Wi-Fi app developers is lower what, what, than what cellular. Do you mean, what, yeah, what do you mean with Wi-Fi app? So you can, you can build, let's say, uh, application that do traffic monitoring for Wi-Fi, okay. right? And then build some smarts based on, okay, I'm detecting video traffic. I will throttle my video traffic bitrate for a particular user. I, can, I think people can do that more readily than in the cellular space, because in cellular, you have to understand bearers. You have to understand DRBs. You have to understand sleep cycle. You have to understand you know, power management, all sorts of things from a device standpoint and the network standpoint. But on Wi-Fi, you don't need that, I think. It's just server client interactions. Maybe I'm uh, oversimplifying it, but I, I yeah. do believe that's the case. Yeah. Well, some, of the, some things like analysis, like uh, detecting something, uh, I think if we expose the data in a, um, say like what we do in the OSC, Rick, is like there's an X app that uses the KPM service model to collect the information, and then it puts it in the Influx database. So it's basically then it's, you data. don't need to understand E2. You don't need to know how to uh, construct yeah. SN1 messages. You just have data in the database that you're familiar with. And then then if you can do something interesting with that data, that that definitely I could I could see almost anybody who can write programs doing if they have some ideas. I agree. I think there's a question saying uh, people with four to six years of PhDs ahead of them, how to get involved into this research? Like what is the suggestion because of the difficulties you point out of X apps? Well, I think, yeah, Mati kind of answered that question. The best thing is to get trained on domain knowledge first. If you understand a particular aspect of the problem that you want to solve, read all the papers around it, figure out what the algorithm is. So you, I guess uh, the question can be divided into two parts, right? If you are interested in infrastructure development or tooling development, machinery development, as opposed to algorithm development, there's two different tacks, right? If you want to build the algorithm, like radio resource management, how can I build a better radio resource management algorithm? Then you need to read all the papers around radio resource management and come up with a better technique. But if, you're, if your interest is more in X app tooling, how do I make the API more friendly? Or how do I help to ingest the, you know, the data that is coming from the E2 radios in a more um, friendly way? That's a different kind of a computer science kind of a problem. So I think either way, you cannot get away from domain knowledge. You have to read LTE 
literature, you have to read 5G literature, and you have to see where the low hanging fruits are and where the, the difficult problems are. And then slowly start solving those low hanging fruits first. Yeah, and if we step back one second from the rig and think more in general to the general run ecosystem, like uh, what if someone wants to start doing some research on the data plane, on the CU, the U part uh, itself? What what are the, the avenues in which one could uh, get to that ecosystem in a kind of speed it up way so that there's some research that can be done during the time frame of a PhD, for example. This maybe can go to Raymond, who has more well, experience in, you know, in building this. OK, I mean, you know, for when, when it comes to, you know, as, as it, if you want to look at the data plane from the, let's say, the lower layers, so layer one, layer two. So we're talking about some of the, the internal procedures of the, of the DU, if we want to look at a, a, a split architecture. Uh, for me, though, if you want the low-hanging fruit, is, is getting involved in the in the um, some of the scheduling paradigms that you have in in, in the DU. Um, you know that that's typically the bread and butter of the 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 equipment vendor and where they differentiate their their offerings with their with their operator clients is in that component there. And that you know that that's where some of the ideas that are coming out of um, uh, university labs can be extremely useful. Um, but you know the key difficulty is is also related uh, to what was said earlier. Um, you know to really innovate in that space, you you have to have a pretty intimate knowledge of the three GPP standard. Um, you you have to understand the the, uh, the the low layer signaling procedures, and you know it, from a cultural perspective, at least in in, in communities uh, more let's say computer science communities, it's very different from a Wi Fi system. And, uh, you know, that learning, that learning curve is steep. Okay, I mean, I have from experience, we usually do this actually with people that are, that are um, sometimes during their PhD, but it's usually after a PhD even. Researchers that are a little bit more um, well-versed in, uh, you know, in, in fundamentals and then are ready to take the time to learn some of the details of a standard. That, that's, that, that for me, that's one of the challenges there. What can be done to make the curve less steep? Make radio simpler. Make the protocol simpler. <laughs> well, that, that's that's not three GPP. I'm sorry. <laughs> you have to start with three GPP. You have to read. So take take massive MIMO as an example, right? I mean, uh, operators are spending billions of dollars in spectrum, twenty five billion, thirty billion, right? Uh, C band spectrum. Any researcher who comes up with algorithms that utilizes that spectrum more efficiently or doubles the capacity, it's a huge win. It's a, it's a game changer in, in the entire ecosystem. So, uh, you know, there are problems that are low hanging, but the impact of those problems are less. Say, say you come up with uh, network slicing. I'm just giving an example here, don't quote me. Just network slicing example. You can do network slicing in many different ways and you can come up with an algorithm to do a network slice. Okay, that's great. However, let's say you come up with an algorithm that doubles your spectrum capacity. Which one do you think is more valuable? You're looking at a $40 billion industry versus a network slice, which may be a couple of billion, $2 billion. So the problems you pick are really you know, very dependent on the, the complexity of the problem and also the time that you have to solve that problem. In a PhD, I would not pick a problem which is you know, so ambitious that I'm gonna double my spectrum capacity. And of course, I think it depends on, on, on your background and your training also. The other, other thing I would say is there's a lot of buzz around machine learning. Uh, I think it works well in industries like search and product recommendation where you have a lot of this data. However, machine learning used in radios and in cellular, I think the, uh, the promise is there, but I don't see that much of a, a you know, a bang for the money, if you like, because the amount of expertise that you need to understand first the machine learning terminologies and the algorithms, and then to apply it on a, a stochastic system like cellular is difficult. It's, it's, not a, it's not a very low bar, you know, from a application development standpoint, because I, I know that, a lot of people are migrating towards AIML and artificial intelligence and how we can you know, make our algorithms better, right? 
But for that, you need data. So I think actually one of the very first questions I always ask about AIML is, where is the data? If I can get access to the data and I can slice and dice the data and I can make an understanding of what the data means, then I can think about you know, uh, non-heuristic algorithms using AIML. So I think that also makes a big impact on, on research. If you can have access to data and therefore Wi-Fi is much more amenable because you can get you can generate your own Wi-Fi data. Cellular data is very difficult to, to get, but you know, operators can sandbox some of the data and make it available, or simulators, for example. Yeah, and, and now there's more of these platforms like Powder and uh, and uh, Cosmos. And uh, so there are in academic uh, platforms where I would assume that it's easier for academics to get access to data. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the, the, we discussed some of these yesterday, we showed like, uh, how we use another test that is called Colosseum to basically generate data sets in an automated way. So there's definitely ways to, to do this. But if we go back a little bit to the standard to also answer one of the questions that uh, come in, like uh, the free GPP is difficult, right? You, you, you mentioned this. Uh, is there anything that can be done to help improve how the free GPP standards come out? Or like is anything that Oran can do to make or on standards, for example, easier to read than the standards. Yeah, I, I think there are certain things that you can do. Like I was explaining these data models, right? Uh, so how can you not learn 3GPP and still, still do a decent job? So these models are called network resource models, NRMs, right? And 3GPP has specified these NRMs uh, to very excruciating detail. And so, Either you go and learn those NRMs in 3GPP, you read these 500 page documents to figure out you know, the hierarchy and which, which uh, attribute you're really looking after. The other approach would be to come up with a canonical model or a, or a unified data model that, that represents in a very simple way what that uh, hierarchy or the data structure is. So OpenRAN can, I think, make an effort to create that unified data model. It's a, it's a difficult job, but I think rather than having developers understand the entire 3GPP spec and where these NRM models and how they behave, you know, OpenRAN can kind of create an equivalent data model that is easier to understand and unified such that people can, you know, address it very quickly without having to understand all the nitty gritty details. I think that's definitely one thing that, that, that can be done. Yeah, if I can uh, comment, um, I, I, I didn't, I'm, I have a computer science background. So I, my background is in distributed systems and fault tolerance and dependability and those kinds of things. So I didn't know anything about RAN about three or four years ago. So it's, it's been a steep learning curve. But, but what, I've, what I've realized that I don't need to understand all the three GPP protocols and standards uh, to address some use case like traffic steering, for example. I don't understand. I don't need to understand the beam forming and stuff in order to work on, on traffic steering. Um, and I think the um, E2 service models might be maybe a little bit lower bar uh, to like if you start looking at some E2 service model and see because the service model describes okay here are the data items you can subscribe to. Of course, you may need to go to the three GPP standard to understand what they mean. Uh, but, uh, and then, then there's what you can do, what, what policies and what controls you can, you can use. So, uh, so I wouldn't, I don't think that you need to understand everything to get started. At least that's my feeling. You can learn incrementally. Which is, which is good, right? So it's, uh, at least there's a starting point. Yeah. So just to, I'm looking at the questions that are coming in, in the chat and thanks everyone for asking. So one question that is also close to something that I wanted to ask is uh, what's the path toward like the adoption of more open approaches on foreign architecture in actual production environment, right? So the question is asking actually, what's your view on the reaction of traditional equipment manufacturers to the open approach of Oran? 
Well, I would say Nokia, for example, is very active with the E2 interface um, standard. So, um, and other others like Mavenir. Um, uh, so there are there are ma many vendors, and well, all the vendors are pretty much part of ORAN, uh, including Ericsson, etc. So, so the vendors are at least uh, open to the idea. And of course, the the uh, big hurdle is at least so what, from my what about point. operators? No, actually, operators. I think uh, a lot of you can see PR releases from different uh, operators where they have they are publishing results from uh, trials with Rick and X apps. If you Google it, you probably find at least half a dozen. So, uh, including mm -hmm. some AT and T ones, although they are kind of old, but. Uh, I think the operators at this point are exploring the technology and doing trials with uh, with uh, individual things. From my point of view, the biggest hurdle is really getting the vendors to implement uh, the E2 service models or powerful enough E2 service models on the CUs and VUs. Uh, initially, I felt like the standards were moving very slowly, but, but now it seems like at least we got the E2SMRC, which I feel is very powerful, uh, standardized, and now it's just a matter of getting, getting those implemented. And uh, then I think, uh, like the the, uh, I've I've given internal presentation on, on this kind of Rick stuff, and and I have this analog of three-legged chair, and one of the legs is standards, one of them is is. Uh, E2 service models, uh, sorry, RIC platforms, and one of the is the implementation of those. And, and I feel like RIC platforms are moving along really nicely. There's probably half a dozen platforms that are soon commercially available, or at least uh, somewhat commercially available. And the standards are now moving along. So it's not it's just a matter of getting the E2 service models implemented in the G node Ds and E node Ds. Yeah, that's something I was wondering myself. For example, the E2SM KPM as refers to FreeGPP documents for the list of KPMs, which are many, right? Yeah, there's uh, there's there's another step that needs to be done. Uh, these standards are still pretty uh, broad. Like for example, E2SM RC has a policy-based control style and and control-based control style. So the vendors are not going to implement the whole specification. They are going to implement some subset of it. So we need to find out from the vendors, well, what are they going to implement? What are they going to expose? And, and only then we can start building X apps that actually use the real uh, uh, commercial RAN equipment. Yeah, and is this more an service, issue? Uh, more service uh, models have to come into existence. I think well, part of the problem with ORAN is also the service models take a lot of time to, to be realized, to be standardized. Right? If you have many, many different service models, right, then I guess the vendors can also pick and choose uh, some subset to implement. Uh, the fact that I think there is only three or four service models today is, uh, you know, it's, a, it's progress, but I think it's slow. But so then how, how do you, if if the vendors can pick and choose what to implement, right? How can you guarantee yeah. interoperability? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, if you are talking a particular service model, then you have to faithfully represent that service model, right? So the XAP developers can actually uh, make that function call and actually get what, what, the, what the radio advertises uh, as per the service model. So uh, that XAP has to work um, as soon as, let's say, uh, you know, vendor A radio and a vendor B radio both implement that E2 service model, then they should be interoperable. You know, some of the features that the E2 service models are mandatory, some are optional. So the mandatory features should be should be the baseline target and XF should be interoperable across both types of uh, vendor radios. But obviously each vendor would build their own secret sauce and then it might get, you know, that's when, that's when the real, uh, you know, question is. I think there's a question on P4. I think, uh, so keep in mind that ORAN is really about control plane. It's not really about user plane, right? All of this radio resource management, RM is about control plane. 
So, and B4, as far as I understand, is all about packet processing, data pipeline packet processing, right? Uh, SDN control data pipeline packet processing. So, I think there are some, there is some work that people have looked in to using P4 to for the packet core, the user plane function, the UPF, where they are basically using P4 to uh, change properties of that user plane function. You know, throttle the UPF or uh, give more resources to the UPF using P4 design. I don't think I've seen anything of P4 that addresses the control plane. Uh, at least P4 chips or P4 protocol is not used to design control planes. I may be wrong, but uh, that may be a area of research. Yeah. yeah, and if we go back to the user plane, right? Like uh, Raymond, for example, maybe you can comment on this. What are uh, have you ever considered using P4 in uh, in your implementation or like uh, Florian earlier mentioned some accelerations that you're looking at for the for OAI. Then we had uh, Anupa that discussed GPU based acceleration. So there's different way to accelerate the user plane. Like, do, do you have any view on what should be the way and what are well, things? Well, I, I, a little bit. I mean, we are floating these ideas. To be perfectly honest. Um, you know, I, as was just mentioned, the, the, it, it is useful in the UPF. So it, it does the acceleration for the, the GTP switching. Um, so that the, that's something that is definitely not efficient in software. And, you know, there are quite a few companies today that are that are providing solutions using P4 Fabric for the UPF. The, the question remains whether you can do that in a CU uh, user plane function. So the, the which is basically implementing the, the PDCP layer and SDAP, but that, that's not, not much of a big deal. Um, the, the main issue there in, in the user plane of the, of the RAM is that there are also security um, features and he header compression. So then those, those are, you know, those are very heavy functions to accelerate. Um, so I'm not sure that P4 by itself is going to help. It'll definitely help with the GTP, uh, which you need in, in the, uh, the CU uh, user plane function also. Um, but it won't, it won't necessarily help for the security and the, the header compression. So you might have to combine that with, uh, for instance, FPGA acceleration uh, in conjunction with P4. And I think you'll maybe find solutions that are being floated with um, solutions from Xilinx or, or Intel Altera uh, for doing that sort of thing. Yeah, and uh, you, you seem to focus specifically on FPGA acceleration. Any thoughts on GPU-based acceleration? Well, I think there are interests uh, in using GPU acceleration in, in layer one. Um, and in fact, there are solutions today from, uh, from NVIDIA. There, there's a full layer one stack um, that, that, it, that is available. Uh, it's not open source, but, uh, but it is definitely something that exists. Uh, today in, in, in OAI, we do have partners that have done uh, LDBC decoding acceleration with GPU. Um, and I think, uh, you know, if you, if you were to do some, some uh, uh, you know, signal processing for massive MIMO arrays, uh, that, that could be one, uh, that could be one uh, solution. It remains to be seen, though, if, you know, with respect to latency, you can do that efficiently. Um, getting data in and out of a GPU is not always the, um, not always the easiest thing to do efficiently. And if we talk about latency, given that there's a question on, uh, uh, it's slightly in, for a slightly different context, but it's still about latency and scale, right? So uh, we have different latencies. We have latency in the top plane, latency in the in the control plane, latency in the management plane. And how moving to software affects all of this? Uh, what are the limitations that software-based platform have that, for example, hardware-based platform do not have? Well, this, well yeah, with, the, with the RIC, um, it's, it's, uh, there's an additional thing that the RIC is separate from the CU and DU. So it's, uh, we're actually implementing functions and algorithms that previously were running on the CU or DU in the separate RIC component. So, so there's there's definitely a late additional latency element there, and uh, so there's there's basically certain use cases. So thinking is that any use cases that are where you can implement the control in about ten milliseconds or higher, 
would be considered recuse cases. If the requirement is less than 10 milliseconds, it has to be implemented on the CU or DU. Um, uh, and then if it goes over a second or 10 seconds, then it's a non-real-time recuse case. Um, so, so, yeah. For, for, for One example. problem that may be worthwhile thinking about is the conflict uh, mitigation problem. When you have multiple applications, if it was, uh, think traditionally, if everything was built like what Marty is saying inside the CU, right? All the algorithms are in the CU built by one vendor, then they have full access to everything, right? The whole state machine is embedded in the CU. Now that state machine is not is split. Some are in RIC, some are inside, some is inside the CU. So whatever decision make uh, the, the R app or the X app is making. And think of the XF being coming from different vendors, right? Uh, vendor A is providing an XF, vendor B is providing another XF, vendor C is providing another XF, right? They're all sitting inside the same rig. They're all making decisions about the radio. Some is saying increase the transmit power. Some is saying change the uh, PRB utilization. Some saying shut it down, right? So you have, so now who is going to arbitrate? Who, who will say which sequence it should be done? And when is it a conflict? When is it not a conflict? Who will do that scheduling approach? So that's a that's a very interesting problem. I think it's it's not there today because today everything is done by the same vendor and they have full access to all their features. Now here you do not. Yeah. So software here I think has created an additional problem, multi-vendor problem that did not exist before. And it's a it's a it's a interesting problem that's not easy to solve, but. I think it's worth yeah, and thinking. if you look at the Oran specification, this problem is mentioned, but not much more, right? So is yeah. there anything going on in the standardization activities about this? There is some, uh, I mean, apart from very high level, there's, I don't think so, uh, at least in working group three and working group two, uh, they define what conflict is and they define certain categories on what conflict, uh, how to address this conflict, but not no special mechanisms or policies that you can use to resolve those conflicts. Uh, and like you're saying, right, everything is, has to happen in 10 millisecond or one millisecond. You don't have a whole lot of time to, you know, resolve to these conflict mitigation strategies, right? But so, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't think there is a very simple clear cut answer, but it's definitely worth uh, simplifying. Yeah, and that, that kind of ties into the integration problem, like uh, the conflict resolution would be the runtime thing, but, yeah. but even integrating, saying, okay, we have this interesting X app from vendor X, uh, can we add that into our current RIC without it uh, messing up with anything? Like, how do you test that? How do you, how do you make sure and who is going to do that? That's, that's a big question. Like, is it the RIC vendor? Is it the telco provider? Is it some third, yet another third party that does integration testing of, of X apps uh, together? Yeah, uh, that's totally unknown question at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it seems like that software is bringing new new problems in. Right, one is this. What about security, for example? Do you have any thoughts on like? What are the advantages of this and disadvantages that having a run that is open and sometimes open source or having a rig that is open and sometimes open source bring to, to this problem? Right, Mati. <laughs> well, generally, uh, the, the security and oh, I can I can answer the security and open source question in general. Uh, people people argue that open source is more secure because people uh, there can be lots of eyes looking at it. But but uh, there is work in Oran uh, on security. I think it's in early stages, but uh, I haven't participated in it myself. So. I can't really comment on how far they are and what the conclusions are. Yeah, they, I think they're in the uh, stage where they are specifying what security mechanism or protocol to use uh, for E2, for A1, for O1, you know, DTLS and TLS, that kind of, just like what, what should be the right mechanisms for security? Yeah. So like I think Mati, you know what all the security use cases, right? That are interesting. 
uh, E2-based security use cases? Yes, yes, there's there's definitely secu uh, use cases where we would have X apps that implement some new security capabilities. Uh, like one of the use cases that we introduced from at and to the working group one is a signal storm protection use case that is is protecting the network from signaling storm attacks. But I think your question was more about how how does this opening opening up the RAN uh, makes it does it make it less secure or more secure? And yeah, there's definitely yeah. work to be done there to make it secure. Mm -hmm. And in general, what what are like we already mentioned a couple of problems like the conflict mitigation, the security. What are other problems that are new and emerging when you transition from hardware-based approaches to software-based approaches and open approaches? Any, any? Performance, I think uh, today, traditional radios, their line rate at which they serve traffic is phenomenal, right? They, because it's the hardware that is doing the job. To have commensurate performance in a software, and not just RAN, I think even in the data center world, Right, it's it's not they're not equivalent right now, right? So, I think that that's definitely as time goes, you know, as I guess Intel or AMD they come up with high, higher processing powers, many cores inside your chipsets. How to partition? I think how to partition the workload to utilize these CPU cores uh, in an intelligent way. Uh, I think it's is important because as more and more applications are sitting on the ecosystem, you only have a certain hardware that is sitting inside the cell site, right? In the DU, uh, a virtualized DU. And so you're not gonna change that virtualized DU hardware every three months, right? It's there, they've, they've made the investment, it's gonna be sitting there. And now you're thinking of putting these intelligent applications that reside on that DU, right? or reside on that RAN controller in the CU. So I think the question about how to partition hundreds of X apps that are running at that line rate and still utilizing the resources and the CPU cores in a, in a you know, in an equitable way is, it needs to be thought through because right now we are in the stage where we're running maybe one, two, handful of X apps, right? So you're not really stress testing the system. When it stresses, when you have hundreds of X apps running, you know, different features uh, that are running from multi-vendors, multi that resource is a very uh, uh, precious resource, right? It needs to be really, thought, scheduling becomes, very, it's like almost a computer, right? You need to really schedule, right? You can't have an X app that'll hog the entire C, uh, 24 cores and say, okay, I have access to everything. You don't have it. Right, so time slicing it and uh, core slicing it uh, becomes uh, very important. So that's why I think you see a lot of research going on right now with this uh, layer one virtualization where they're doing the slicing for L1 virtualization. So all this L1 work gets sliced. Uh, basically the video cores are getting sliced. And how do you apportion that resource uh, in an equitable manner is, is definitely a new problem, I think. It was not there before because you're, they're using COTS hardware not, not uh, you know, uh, not vendor hardware, right? So that, that's something. Yeah. The other I, problem is I think the GPUs. No, sorry, go ahead, Martin. Yeah, yeah for that, uh, I think the RIC is even maybe more complicated. Of course, for any CU and DU, uh, the CPU and resource demand is driven by the amount of traffic, but the, the XAPs, given that they have, uh, well, of course, their workload is driven by the traffic as well, uh, how many control messages, how many reports they are receiving. But given that the E2 offers this dynamic subscription, I think that makes things even more uh, maybe variable because you might think of an X app that only makes subscriptions under certain conditions. And, and so the amount of messages a, one particular X app receives depends on those conditions. And, and uh, uh, so there's definitely a lot of planning has to be done to make sure that uh, what if that condition is true for all the E2 nodes and 
this X app is now subscribing to all the E2 nodes, how much traffic it's getting and how much resources mm -hmm. it needs to process those. Yeah, and I think performance is also concerning the, the run part as, as we discussed uh, during this panel. So, uh, but- The question on security. I think yeah. uh, this question on security is interesting. Uh, basically, I think they're asking is, if you have to implement security at the expense of latency, how can you have a trade-off, right? Mm -hmm. Security is gonna take some time and resource and your control loop is also running in the order of milliseconds, right? Less than 10 milliseconds. So you have you have a trade-off system that needs to be balanced, right? Can you do security as well as have 10 millisecond round trip time? And scale. Probably. And scale. So I think one answer is, uh, you know, now companies like Qualcomm and Marvel, they're having this uh, NIC cards where you can do this inline acceleration, inline, as opposed to look aside acceleration. So all these security features, you know, maybe can be implemented in that uh, NIC, smart NIC module. So as the packets are coming through, that smart NIC has an algorithm that treats the packet in whatever security algorithm and then inlines it to, to the CPU, to the next, uh, to the RIC app, to the X app. So that, that's the piece of, uh you know research that i think definitely is making sense security accelerators yeah something like that right yeah and uh, if we look at the, the other question versus another one that is closely related and something that we've already touched upon is like uh, how to integrate this acceleration this fpga based acceleration or the CPU part, GPU part with the software, right? How to be to integrate acceleration and software in an effective way. And I would say also probably open source approaches, right? But it's, it's not easy to uh, generally combine open source with uh, uh, hardware based acceleration in terms of availability, licensing models, and so on. Yeah. It yeah, I think that question is slightly there. How to integrate both vision in an effective way, right? Uh, hardware and software, yeah. I mean, all the software is getting containerized, right? So you have to run a container environment. And essentially the container environment has to run equivalent to bare metal performance. If you can, if you can assure containerized workload runs equivalent in terms of performance to bare metal, then you're not losing out by containerizing something or even virtualizing using VMs. So I think that it has to be there. Where is the RIC deployed? Mati, <laughs> as an operator, where is the RIC deployed? Um, yes, uh, well, I can, I can just talk about some of the initial kind of sizing exercises we did. Um, yeah, that's, when we that's started, uh, started this RIC project. So, uh, just looking at our network, um, uh, we we estimated that one RIC instance could support maybe 1,000 E2 nodes, and and then uh, for the latency, we assumed that well, since there was this 10 millisecond control loop latency requirement, uh, we assumed that the network latency in one way would be at most four milliseconds. So uh, it would leave uh, essentially for the control loop, it would leave just two milliseconds to the RIC and the XAP and, and eight milliseconds for network latency back and forth. So of course, it, uh, that was just a sizing exercise before we had anything. So, um, so the thinking is still that one RIC instance would manage a uh, few hundred at least uh, E2 nodes. And uh, I think the network latency would be, um, well, by, by having more RIC instances and pushing them closer to the E2 nodes, of course, we kind of give more time for the X app. So it really, we need to, we need to get these RIC platforms when they are commercially mature and basically evaluate them and evaluate the use cases. Um, so it's, it's not, yeah. How, yes, how can you share a picture? It might help. 
Yeah, but how can the, the, the question I think is how can you evaluate with something that is future proof? Right? As we was saying, you're not going to change the rig platform, the hardware on which the rig platform runs soon. Or, or maybe you are, I don't know. So, uh, any thoughts on, on this? I mean, the, I guess the hardware doesn't get changed, but at least uh, the algorithms can be changed, right? Uh, here, here is what I think Mati was talking about. You have the users, the RAN, the radio cell site, the accelerator, the DU, where the accelerators are, and then the edge cloud where the RICs are. This is near real time, near real. I think the question was actually where is real time. There is no concept of real time. Real time is here in the DU where scheduling is happening in the millisecond, one millisecond, TTI, TTI level scheduling. So it's not a controller per se. Controller is over here, the RIC, near real time. And then non-real time is perhaps over here, right in the central central cloud, which I don't show. That's kind of the hierarchy. Non near real time, non real time, and the real 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 time is really in the DU. Right? Yeah, and the the question of uh, that the hardware doesn't change. Of course, we could uh, depending on the use cases. So we could deploy if we have the initial use cases are not of the ten millisecond variety. Maybe they are hundred millisecond variety. Right. We could deploy fewer rigs and and they would be some of the E2 nodes would be further away. But then if we uh, come up with new use cases that require tighter deadlines, then we could deploy more and basically reallocate which E2 nodes are connected to which RIC instances. And of course, the uh, one thinking is also, depending on the use cases, but maybe we have some regions of the country that are not, where the network is not highly loaded. And, and for example, doing, uh, optimization of the spectrum usage is not so necessary there because there's plenty of spectrum. Whereas other places like New York City or something are much much more congested and you kind of need to uh, do the clever techniques there. So maybe we wouldn't manage all the nodes with RIC potentially. So there are all these all these possibilities and they depend on the use cases that, that we will uh, implement on the RICs. All right. Thank you very much. So we're almost at the end of, of the, the session. So I would like just a quick thought from uh, each one of you on what are the key challenge, what is the key challenge to address like for software and open approaches in the next year or couple of years so that we can actually make this something that will be deployed and will be part of uh, the 5G and 6G ecosystems. Key uh, challenge yeah. for the academic community or, or the industry in as a whole? In general. In general. <laughs> or you, think, can, you, or yeah. you can pick. Right? No, I, I think in the academic community, definitely what will make open run flourish is you need new ideas of applications, of RAN, RAN control applications. Uh, it's like saying that when Apple created the marketplace, they did not know a billion apps was going to be created, right? They obviously didn't think of the billion application ideas. Similarly here, now you have the infrastructure that is created or the controllers that are created with the SDKs. People need to start thinking, how do I build different kinds of control applications for drones, for security, for you know, AI-enabled stuff? So that, that's definitely a challenge because we are in the initial days and it's very small. And then on the vendor side, I mean, on the industry side, getting mature feature ready uh, applications is a challenge. Okay. You, can, you can build R apps and X apps today, you know, small incremental R apps and X apps, but to have it really feature tested and ready that runs in a, a commercial network, that, that's a definitely a challenge, yeah, in my opinion, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I would I would agree with uh, Ritwik that the uh, the good challenge for the academic community, especially, would be to think of uh, new ideas, uh, new XAP ideas, uh, new things that we could do, and then then even even if the uh, service models are not supporting those ideas, basically, if the idea is good enough, then you can bring it to the community yeah. and 
and get uh, companies behind it to extend the service models and create a new service model that enables this. If from from my perspective, it's a little you know a little along the same lines, but maybe a bit more academic. Um, you know, I think in general the testing methodologies as the networks become completely disaggregated and and multi uh, multi vendor uh, become critical. Uh, you know, today it's hard enough to make an end to end system work from one vendor with with the, the variety of terminals that exist. Uh, now to do it where pieces of software left and right are coming from different uh, different sources. Um, that, that's going to be a major challenge. I mean, 3GPP has testing specifications, but not uh, not to the extent where you are going to be able to do that properly. Um, and also from the perspective of the community of developers now, uh, this type of software is quite different than, than uh, traditional uh, software. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the necessary tools for communities to produce a, a carrier grade piece of software in this sense um, is going to be a major challenge too. All right. Yeah, I think these, these are some very good takeaway, like just as a closing thoughts, there are a lot of opportunities and we've seen like from bringing effect in, from an effective way of bringing machine learning to the run to an effective way of implementing self-organizing networks, to an effective way of democratizing the access to the, uh, the run and the software that runs the around right so i think this is like at least at, from my perspective something very interesting and like all these challenges that you mentioned are something that are are where i would like to see myself working or and i hope that the community will also uh, agree with this in uh, in the next few years so thank you very much for uh for joining as panelists um uh, and uh Thank you very much to all the attendees for uh, sticking around uh, these two days. Uh, I would also like to thank Sig Mobile uh, for the support, uh, all the speakers that have joined between yesterday and today, uh, Leonardo, uh, Stefano, Tommaso, and Mano for all the great help that, uh, in, uh, in organizing this. And uh, stay tuned because uh, we'll organize another uh, version of this workshop in the next uh, spring, hopefully, uh, maybe in, per in person. So this workshop was more focused on the run. We'll organize something that is more focused on the software for the core and the edge. All right. With this, thank you very much. And uh, I'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.